the road from dark mind to shiny metal is a long one. On our program this week, prospecting, extraction, and refining. Although metals are relatively abundant in the Earth's crust, they are concentrated in specific areas, deposits. These geological formations are widely scattered throughout the world. And finding one is a little like finding a needle in a haystack. Try and imagine everyday life without steel, copper, aluminum, or gold. For all industrialized societies, locating and exploiting mining opportunities is a vital necessity. The birth of a mine is, however, preceded by a lengthy gestation period. The Earth's crust is indeed a veritable cocktail, presenting virtually all known chemical elements. But on average, most of these elements are only present in the form of traces. Only a deposit that is a concentrated ore mass is worth exploiting commercially. In the Earth's crust, deposits are generally the exception rather than the rule. They came about according to various scenarios. In eastern Canada, for example, large copper and zinc deposits were formed nearly three billion years ago within huge immersed volcanic masses. For thousands of years, seawater is thought to have filtered into these masses. As it approached the magma, a semi-liquid rock stored at the bottom of the volcanoes, the water became hot and dissolved the metallic elements in the rocks. The solution then rose toward the sea floor, and upon contact with the icy water, the metals in the solution deposited in the form of ores, high in sulfur, called sulfides. Additional factors were also required for these deposits to attain any appreciable size, such as the presence of a layer of porous rocks, which acted as a mineral trap. Moreover, for them to reach us, these mineralized deposits needed to be protected by a layer of rock. For as the oceans withdrew, the deposits would have been exposed to erosion by wind and water. Still, that protective layer mustn't be too thick, since to be mined, the deposits have to be located at accessible depths. The formation of a deposit is simply the result of a combination of circumstances. The geologists assigned to mining exploration do almost what you might call detective work. Their first task is to identify a target that is a promising area. To do this, they first study the geological environment of the region they are interested in and gather various clues on the site. Outcroppings, areas where the rock is naturally laid bare, are an excellent source of information. These sites can reveal, for instance, very ancient lava flows or volcanic blasts, or a favorable environment for the formation of a deposit. Chemical analyses of rock samples collected from outcroppings provide useful data as well. Quite often, the mineral-rich fluids that led to the formation of the deposit altered the chemistry of the rock over a more extensive area than the deposit itself. Certain elements are then more abundant and others more scarce than the average. These chemical anomalies can all be indicators of the presence of an ore. However, outcroppings only provide information about the surface layer of rock, and they only represent a small portion of the territory, which is mostly covered in vegetation and unconsolidated deposits. Fortunately, geophysics provides other clues. This science makes it possible to measure from the ground or even by plane some of the physical properties of rocks down to depths of 100 meters.
For example, studying variations in the Earth's magnetic fields, measured by magnetometer, can help locate iron deposits or faults where gold might be found. The electric or electromagnetic conductivity of rocks, assessed by inducing a current by remote control, is another useful gauge, since some minerals are good conductors of electricity. However, while these preliminary studies may be promising, they in no way guarantee the presence of a deposit. This requires further verification, for example, by diamond drilling. Sample collecting is done with a drill rod, the end of which is coated with small industrial diamonds. This technique enables geologists to collect rock cores from fairly great depths. The cores are then chemically analyzed to confirm the presence of the ore and assess its concentration. Interpreting the results can be tricky, since drilling only supplies information pertaining to a very small area. It's a little like going fishing. Only the drawing up of a model that is a plausible scenario of the local geological history will outline the location of the field, its formation, and size. And should an interesting deposit in fact be discovered as a result of these various analyses, it does not necessarily mean the mine will be exploited. There are economic factors to be taken into account, such as the proximity of transport infrastructures or market forecasts as to the metal's value during the mining process. In fact, statistics show that for thousands of sites displaying geological anomalies, only one will ever become a mine. Imagine descending into the depths of a mine. It's dark, but also hot and humid because of the heat from the Earth's core. An interesting trek, but brief compared to the one the ore has to make before becoming an everyday object. The Earth subsoil is a veritable warehouse of raw materials, metals of all kinds and potential uses, but a warehouse not readily accessible and whose products, ores, have to undergo numerous transformations before yielding the metal. Let's take the example of copper, one of the most common base metals. Seen from the surface, a head frame signals the presence of an underground ore mine. This building houses the heavy winches used to lower the elevator cages by steel cable down into the mine and back up again. The elevator descends a vertical shaft that provides access to the various levels of the mine. At each level, a network of horizontal galleries leads to the areas where the ore is extracted. It is at these tapping points that the extraction sequences take place. In this mine, for instance, explosives are used. The miners use powerful hydraulic drills with tungsten heads to bore into the rock. Explosives are then loaded into the holes. The mine is evacuated, and the explosives are fired by remote control. This is done from a control station located at the surface. The ore is collected in squat shuttle loaders. Once a tapping area has been emptied of its ore, it is filled with valueless waste rock and sealed up. This is done because the hollows left in the rock would tend to alter the play of underground pressures and in time cause collapses. The shuttle loaders empty their cargo into a crusher. The crusher breaks the ore into small fragments. The fragments are conveyed to the surface via the access shaft. Only 2% of the ore extracted from the mine is copper. To obtain pure copper, a whole series of processes is necessary. 
The first treatment, called concentration, is carried out at a plant located in the vicinity of the mine. The crushed ore is ground into tiny particles. The ore is then mixed with water containing chemical reagents. This yields a semi-liquid paste. The paste is placed in basins into which air and foaming agents are injected to form a floating scum. Under the effect of the chemical reagents incorporated in the paste, the copper-bearing particles adhere to the surface of the bubbles of scum. The copper particles are recovered by skimming, and the particles of rock that have no economic value fall to the bottom of the basins. Once it has been filtered, the scum yields a concentrate that is 24% copper. The concentrate is then sent to another plant, the foundry. At the foundry, the concentrate is placed into a series of furnaces where it is heated at high temperature. The concentrate liquefies. Nozzles inject oxygen-enriched air into the liquid, triggering a chemical reaction. During this reaction, called smelting, the unwanted substances, such as sulfur and iron, combine with the oxygen. Slag, that is a liquid residue with little economic value, is produced. Since it is lighter than copper, the slag floats on the surface and is simply skimmed off the metal. Once this process is completed, 99% pure copper is obtained. It is then cast into molds and cooled. The smelting process releases a toxic gas, sulfur dioxide, which is responsible for acid rain. However, such emissions can be avoided. Indeed, in this foundry, 70% of the sulfur dioxide is recovered and sent to a special mill where it is converted into sulfuric acid used in the chemical industry. In addition, most of the solid waste is incorporated back into the copper production line and thus recycled. These processes, once quite harmful to the environment, are now much more environmentally compatible. Less than 1% of the thick copper plates produced in the foundry contains impurities. A final treatment, electrolysis, will eliminate them. The impure copper plates, called anodes, are first immersed in a bath containing an acid solution. They are placed alternately with thin layers of pure copper called cathodes. A very strong electric current is made to circulate between the anodes and the cathodes. The current causes the copper atoms to become ions, or charged particles. The ions break away from the anode, pass through the acid solution, and cling to the surface of the cathode, where they form new copper. The impurities, however, do not follow the same route. Instead, they deposit on the bottom of the tanks in the form of slurries, high in precious metals, and are recovered. The cathodes, therefore, become coated with very pure copper. After about 10 days, they can be removed from the tanks and sent on to other converting plants. The copper will be used to make a host of everyday objects, ranging from electric cables to computer circuits. Thus ends the long road from the mine to the metal. Gold and its cousin silver are among the few metals found in nature in a free state. Scarcity and beauty have made these metals symbols of wealth. But gold and silver inspire the creative geniuses of artists as well. Precious metals have been much sought after and coveted for millennia. Fortunately, they have also inspired craftsmen to create works of incomparable beauty. Jewelry, sculptures, utensils, all bear witness to our fascination with these astonishing gifts from the Earth's crust. Precious metals are either directly extracted from their seams or obtained as byproducts by refining more common metals. For example, copper ore often contains small amounts of gold and silver. 
through a series of processes, these valuable impurities can be recovered, first in the form of slurry after electrolysis of the copper. Then, after further treatment, we obtain a golden metal. Through electrolysis, a silver sand is extracted from the golden metal. The sand is then melted into 1,000 ounce ingots. Electrolysis of the golden metal also produces slurries high in gold. This is recovered by a chemical process. Refining a ton of copper will yield two to three ounces of pure gold, which will be cast into 400 ounce ingots. These metals have numerous technological applications. For example, gold is used to make computer circuits, and silver is used in the composition of photographic films. But the noble metals have other qualities, exquisitely displayed in the arts of jewelry and gold or silver smithing. Craftsmen never use pure silver or gold, but rather alloys of these metals. Indeed, in their pure state, gold and silver are too soft to be crafted into usable objects. The atomic structure of these metals accounts for their malleability. In pure metals, the atoms are arranged in a regular pattern, which presents small defects. When stress is applied on that structure, due to these defects, the metal will twist or is easily compacted because the rows of atoms slip over each other. However, if such a metal as copper is incorporated in the gold or silver, the mixture hardens. This is because the copper atoms partially block the easy movement of the atomic planes. The metal obtained is thus more resistant than the pure metal. For jewelry and cutlery, sterling silver is used. It is an alloy that consists of 92.5% of silver and 7.5% of copper. As for gold, it is used in the form of alloys whose purity is expressed in carats. Pure gold corresponds to 24 carats. The most common alloys, 10, 14, and 18 carats, contain 42, 58, and 75% of gold, respectively. These gold alloys contain silver and often another metal. This combination does not alter the brilliance so characteristic of gold, but brings it out, sometimes changing its color. For instance, copper gives gold a red color and nickel a white luster. The jeweler usually makes small ingots with these silver or gold alloys. To do so, he uses a fire clay crucible connected to an ingot mold. Heated by a soldering torch, the metal melts and flows into the mold. Thanks to a property called ductility, the jeweler can easily make very thin sheets from these ingots. He passes the ingot through a rolling mill, which consists of two parallel cylinders and is turned by a crank. Passing the ingot through the rollers thins it, and the process can be repeated until the sheet has the desired thickness. The ductility of precious metals also allows them to be stretched into long wires this is done by coupling the rolling mill with a die that uses a plate pierced with holes of various sizes. The ingot is drawn, that is pulled through smaller and smaller holes until it reaches the desired diameter. In theory, one gram of gold can be drawn into a wire several kilometers long. These wires and sheets serve as a basis for many pieces of jewelry they can be cut as wanted without losing their shape with a hardened steel saw. They can also be soldered over a fire stone with a fine flame gun. A soldering seam welds the pieces together. The seam is a metallic alloy that melts at a lower temperature than the precious metal. Once it has been heated, the object must however be bathed in acid to restore its luster because heat oxidizes metal and blackens it. In particular, rings are made by soldering. The rings are threaded up on a triblet, a stick marked with graduated sizes on which they are given the required shape. Once the piece is completed, 
All that remains is the finishing, such as polishing or sanding. Platinum does not have the exact same properties as gold and silver. Among others, it is harder, which is why jewelers use it to make the collets and sprongs used to crimp on the stones. All precious metals withstand oxidation and corrosion, except silver. Silver will tarnish slightly on contact with oxidizing agents containing sulfur, but it is easy to clean. That immutability over time is no doubt the noble metal's most precious quality. Thanks to it, we are able to admire objects that are centuries old, and the works of contemporary artisans will easily survive the centuries to come. We still rely on good old Mother Earth to satisfy all our metal needs. It is an immense reservoir, but limited. We must learn to use it wisely and sparingly.